cruciferous vegetables. Neither of you are talking about, oh man, we need to eat a million vegetables. Kate, what do you say? I would say that I think you can get all your nutrients from animal-based foods plus fruit and roots. And I think the cruciferous or anything goitrogenic um, is when, again, I look at it at a digestibility level, are super hard for your body to process. I think they have low energy um, in them. And so certainly for me, I want foods that are easy to digest and I want them to provide the system with energy. And the, the cruciferous and leafy greens and all of these high nutrient-based foods also have tons of anti-nutrients in them that, again, are super hard for the body to break down and also can inhibit some other nutrient absorption. So I'm not saying you cannot have them. And, and in fact, for most things I say, hey, if you like these things, cool, have them. Um, I say if you want them, usually cooking them down to kind of decrease the anti-nutrients is the way to go and just make sure that your body can handle them. And I just have some people that, mm -hmm. you know, have been living off and I was one of those people that was living off salads all the time and I had tons of GI issues. I was like bloated constantly. And so until I finally gave them up or at least cooked them, um, you know, I was having some issues, but I just don't anymore. And honestly, fruits to me taste a heck of a lot better than a piece of kale and if, I think most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, don't really love those foods. <laughs> At least that's my opinion. <laughs> that's great. So, Dr. Jamie, real quick. Yeah, well, I, I hated them growing up. But I like to eat broccoli and Brussels sprouts on occasion, but they're definitely cooked. I have no problem with, like, fermented veggies. But most of the vegetables in my diet are, are roots. I think they taste better. Um, but I don't, eat, I don't eat cruciferous vegetables all that often. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So we're against the PUFAs. We we have no time for all these cruciferous vegetables and we're against processed grains or just grains in general, that multiple reasons. Eat human. Les humains à leur meilleur. C'est toi pour hell. Eat cunningen. Eat hell. Eat hell. Eat hell. Eat Hello, everyone. Welcome back once again to Peak Human. I'm Brian Sanders. I'm still working on the Food Lies film daily. It's going very well. We had a few breakthroughs last week, some really cool mental models, visuals, and all this stuff working with our animator and designer. We work on it every day. It's taking a while, but it's going to be so good. I'm so excited. It's just a long process. So this episode is with Kate Deering and Dr. Jamie Seaman. Super fun discussion I've wanted to have for a while. They both are really great and have a little bit different approach to nutrition. It was a really civilized discussion. It wasn't really a debate. They both agree on a lot, including the importance of eating real foods, especially animal products, avoiding highly processed foods like seed oils. They both have a great deal of experience in the Department of Women's Health and the effects of lifestyle on hormonal health. We agreed on a lot, the 80% of things, but the last 20% is interesting because there's two different approaches. If you get all your protein and nutrients from great animal sources, what do you fill up the rest of your diet? with right and for a long time i've been filling it up with mostly fat and i think that's great and then i hear about this other approach i've actually heard about this other approach for quite a while i've heard about the ray pete stuff for years always been interested in it some people have been getting more into it like dr paul saladino he's eating a lot of fruit lately and i've also been experimenting with this myself for the past year adding in some carbs at night from whole sources some sweet potatoes some fruit honey it's really interesting it's very it's very interesting so i wanted to debate is it better to fill in the rest of your diet with fat or carbs or both? So that's the context of this discussion. We get deep into the weeds. We do all kinds of stuff. I thought it was really fun, really interesting. Take a listen. Tell me what you think. I would enjoy your feedback. DM me. Maybe we can have a part two. Maybe we can have two other people in the space have a friendly discussion about it. So Kate Deering is a respected personal trainer and holistic nutritional exercise and lifestyle coach. With more than 20 years experience in the health and fitness industry, she prides herself in her out of the box methods that support metabolic health and improve health and body function. Kate has committed her life to finding the answers to optimal health. 
a high metabolism and true happiness. Her own journey to health and happiness became the foundation of her teachings and helped her understand why health is not established with dieting. Her own journey to health and happiness became the foundation of her teachings and helped her understand why health is not established with dieting and overexercising, but with self-love and an increase in cellular metabolism, usually achieved with eating more and working out less. Interesting. She is the author of the book, How to Heal Your Metabolism, and on Instagram at Kate Deering Fitness. And we also have Dr. Jamie Seaman, who's been on the podcast before. She's a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist practicing in Omaha, Nebraska. Born and raised in the state, she played collegiate softball for the Cornhuskers. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in Nutrition, Exercise, and Health Sciences. She then went on to graduate medical school and completed her OBGYN residency at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. She is currently in private practice at Mid-City OBGYN, offering a full range of services in obstetrics, gynecology, robotic surgery, and primary care. She is a fellow in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona School of Medicine. She's a board certified ketogenic nutrition specialist and has a passion for fitness, preventative medicine, and ketogenic therapy, not only in her medical practice, but in her own life. You can find her on Instagram at Dr. Fit and Fabulous. And she was also on the Titan Games and she's a beast. That's the show that The Rock hosted. So before we jump in, just a few notes. You can go to nosetail.org to get all our new regenerative meats out of West Texas. Man, our new operation is going off. We're having some problems fulfilling all the orders. A little bit of a slowdown, but I think we're back on track as of this week. If you order now, you can get those shipped out next week on Monday and Tuesday. I think we'll have things ironed out by then. That's at nosetail.org. We actually just put up a video of Jessica and Austin, the great beef producers on the Food Lies YouTube, and hopefully it'll make it to the nosetail.org site so you can see this amazing footage of how they raise their animals, all the great methods they use, how they feed their family, such a cool story. You can get those cows in that picture. You can get some of those cattle sent to you and eat those delicious steaks that are featured in that video. So that's at nosetail.org. And we also have the decentralized food project I mentioned on social media. Continue to send me your email. We're going to have a little landing page up soon, but you can DM me your email before then. You can also join our private network at freelynetwork.com, F-R-E-E-L-Y network.com. This is where we're starting the discussions of the decentralized food project. It's extending to a decentralized community, starting with something outside of Austin. Very interesting stuff. Let's start the discussion on the private network, freely, freelynetwork.com. And let's get on to the show. Make sure to give it a review, share it with friends, and start back at episode one. Here is Kate and Dr. Jamie. All right, we're live with Dr. Jamie and Kate Deering. How are you doing today? Great. Great. Thanks for having us, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Absolutely. Well, this is going to be really fun. It's a very friendly, I don't even want to call it debate because we're going to have a fun discussion. And I know we're going to agree on so much. We have a lot of overlap, but there's you know a certain amount, maybe the last 20%, we'll call it, that we want to talk about, right? And we want to get to the bottom of this. We want to look at both sides. That's what I'm all about. You know, I want to hear both sides. Uh, Kate Deering wrote a book called How to Heal Your Metabolism. She's in the kind of bioenergetic diet field. Some people call it pro-metabolic diet. Some people know it more of like Ray Pete style diets. So anything else you, you want to say about yourself as a little intro, Kate? Uh, no, just that I, I've been in the health and nutrition world for about close to 30 years now. So I got a little time on, on both you guys. Mm -hmm. Um but it's definitely been something that has evolved into this approach. And I, I think that, uh, you know, like, like all dietary approaches, they, uh, a lot of different things can work for a lot of different people, depending on what their situation is. I love it. And Dr. Jamie Seaman, you're OBJYN. You were just maybe about to deliver a baby. What's going on with you? Yeah. Yeah. So I work full time as a practicing obstetrician and gynecologist, but my background is in nutrition and exercise science. Uh, I totally agree with Kate. Things are ever evolving. And, you know, when I went through nutrition training and with all the same training that dietitians and registered dietitians had, um, you know, things we were taught back then, it's, it's interesting how information changes. And that's why science is so cool. Um, it, it really is more of an art form because we all have different genetics. We're all built differently. And Kate's exactly right. People respond different to different diets. So I'm super excited about our conversation. I love it. I love it. And yeah, I think we should start with what we agree on. And I don't know, maybe I could start off with what I think we agree on is we're, 
We're okay with animal foods. We're not scared of saturated fats, for sure. Especially, uh, we're against probably all PUFAs, if not just um, definitely omega-6, seed oils, stuff like that. We can talk about the difference in the two PUFAs, you know, omega-3, omega-6. But so we're we're on team animal foods, and we're against PUFAs. I think we got that established. We aren't, yeah, we're, we're kind of counterculture to a lot of the mainstream diet stuff, right? So maybe... Kate, maybe you t tell us your take of your type of diet and how it's yeah different from sort of standard American food pyramid stuff and maybe just give us some more background. Yeah, so if people aren't really have an understanding of the bioenergetic bio view, it's based on the fact that you're looking to su support your body with the, the, the ideal source of energy. So how do you support cellular energy? That's the entire basis of it. And so it's based on utilizing bioavailable nutrients and easy to digest energy sources, which in my world would be carbohydrate sources or easier to digest carbohydrate sources. But it's still coming from a place where we want to provide the body with as much bioavailable nutrition as it possibly can. And so certainly utilizing animal products, animal uh, protein sources are going to be a big part um, it's certainly not the only part. Definitely, we I would say utilizing a lot of dairy, which I know is probably different than what Jamie or at least the ketogenic world uh, prescribes. But utilizing dairy because it's easy to digest as well, as long as you can you can digest the, the uh, lactose. Um, but getting a good amount of calcium um, and providing the body with enough energy <clears throat> via carbohydrates to support energy metabolism. So that's kind of what the sum of what the bioenergetic view is. Um, but ultimately, I think what it, the basis of it, and probably where it's similar to Jamie, is we want to use real food. And this isn't a world where, especially in today's world, where we've all gone sideways, is that we continue to focus on all this processed garbage food that people are consuming and it's getting us into trouble. And any real food diet is going to be better than 90% of the diets out there. But we've gotten so far away from that, and we can blame our government, the USDA, whoever, our FDA, a lot of these organizations for getting people hooked on all this crap. And so I think that's where we definitely have a common ground is like real food is best. I love it. Yeah, I'm in the real food camp from day one, I'm all about it. And so uh, not that Dr. Jamie, you know, represents one type of diet per se, but maybe you could just talk about your kind of background and what you think that it could be best, or I don't know. Yeah. What is the, the, the range of diets that you prescribe maybe? Yeah. So from my perspective, you know, I'm a practicing physician. So when I'm sitting across the the room from a patient, I'm really trying to determine what is their baseline health, what is their baseline metabolic health, and what kind of diet is going to benefit them the most as far as prevention of chronic disease, morbidity, and death. Um, I came into the ketogenic space on a super personal level because I grew up as an athlete, got away with eating really a standard American diet, and ended up with prediabetes. So where I got super passionate in my job was that what I was taught going through nutrition training, which we kind of set the stage how the standard American diet has been skewed so, so poorly when fat was really vilified. So like way back to the 1900s when Crisco and PUFAs and things started to be introduced and all the food manufacturers started putting them in foods, um, our carbohydrates became a higher percentage of our diet. Um, I think PUFAs are to blame for a lot of insulin resistance that we see and not just carbohydrates, but um, I am board certified in ketogenic, you know, nutrition therapy and 88% of our country has abnormal metabolic markers. So for the vast majority of patients that sit across from me, um, you know, across the exam table from me, reducing carbohydrates, which essentially a lot of times means removing processed foods because most of the processed foods are high in added sugars, flours, um, which are different than whole food carbohydrates. Um, is going to benefit them long-term as far as reduction of the things that are most likely to kill them or make their life miserable, which these days are, are cancer and heart disease. And so I'm, I'm a huge fan of controlling carbohydrates um, in the diet. Um, I um, think that our bodies are 
at a baseline source, uh, better at, at fat oxidation and using carbs and glucose um, as the energy sources when needed. I like the idea of metabolic flexibility. Um, if we're constantly eating high carb diets and high glucose diets, um, we never tap into those fat stores. And so what I see clinically is that, you know, a lot of obesity, a lot of overweight people, and you can lose weight a lot of ways. Um, you can lose weight on a McDonald's diet. And so it's all about nutrient density. And so we really have to prioritize that too, um, especially in the pregnant population, you know, when we're talking about epigenetic influence and, and growing another human. But I think that um, where a lot of people are misconceived, I guess, with ketogenic therapies is that, you know, the benefits of keto are just weight loss and that it's really just about calorie restriction. But we have to remember that ketogenic therapy, which was first described for, you know, children with epilepsy, um, it's ketones work as cellular signaling molecules. So there's benefits to having ketones in the bloodstream outside of, of weight loss and, and calorie restriction. And, and we can dive into some of that. So, you know, for me, it's that a patient is free of disease and feels and functions well, and that diet looks different for everybody. I personally am not ketogenic all the time. I kind of waver between ketogenic and paleo. I definitely, I just had Kostava two nights ago. I eat squash and sweet potatoes and berries and things like that. Um, but it's really about fixing the insulin resistance first and then adding in whole food carbs to normal blood glucose levels. So I love that. I love that. And, and I'll just tell the audience, I'm kind of in between both of you. You know, I, I don't, I know I always say I don't have a camp and I'm all, you know, trying to look at all sides, but really the, these two, this pro metabolic side I've been hearing about for years and I've just been becoming more interested in lately. And I, I really am straddling these two approaches now where I'm almost even just doing it on a daily basis where I'm, I'm my lunch is sort of more keto and then my dinner is pro metabolic. It's really interesting how, I, how I'm trying to do it. And it's all an experiment for me. You know, I'm trying to see what's best. And so also I don't want to take sides in this today. I'm going to try to just play both sides and, and really learn from you two and, and see what's going on. So if Kate, um, what, well, I don't know if you want to respond to any of that, or do we want to talk about PUFAs and just dive into that topic? Uh, I mean, I I certainly get where Jamie's coming from because I think same thing with me when I when I work with people, it's definitely looking at you know what diet's going to work best for them, what does their body essentially needs to run optimally, and of course, again, the paradigms that we we change is certainly that I'm more carb based, um, but there's context. And so with every individual, it's never just you need to be eating tons of carbohydrates, and especially if you're having a hard time metabolizing carbohydrates. And so there's always kind of a method to the madness as far as how to get someone, because my goal essentially is how do I get them to be able to metabolize carbohydrates better versus removing the thing that may be they're having an issue metabolizing? Because ultimately... I'm with you, I think we should have extreme metabolic flexibility. We should be able to utilize a variety of different resources. And we, and for most healthy people, we do. We aren't just metabolizing carbohydrates through the day, even if our, our diet is primarily carbohydrates. We use some fat, we use some protein. And then when we sleep, our body tendency under rest likes to utilize fat as fuel. So the muscles like to use fat, brain, or so the heart likes to use fat as fuel. So we are kind of flip-flopping all through these different uh, macronutrients while, when we are healthy. And so for me, the basis is when your body is in stress or when your body's in function, where it's having a high energy need, my belief is it should be running on glucose at that time because that's your quick energy source. That's what the cells, in my opinion, prefer. That's what's going to create essentially the most as we for carbon dioxide, and we can kind of do a caveat and talk about that. But that's certainly a big premise in the bioengineering world is that carbohydrates will produce more carbon dioxide than either fat or, or fat metabolism. So, and that's important because carbon dioxide is ne needed to facilitate oxygen getting into the cell. And when oxygen gets in the tissue, then cellular metabolism improves. So that entire mechanism is important in the biogenic world, and that's why it's always how how can I get that person better able to utilize carbohydrates as fuel, and it and that can be a long process. These aren't quick fixes. This isn't just do this and you're fixed. It's okay. What else do we need to address? And sometimes it's diet is a part of it, but then it's also looking as we I'm sure we would both agree 
the rest of the life has to be taken into consideration <laughs> because if you're just correcting someone's diet and not looking at everything else going on in their, their life, their stressors, their life, how are you sleeping? You know, what other chemicals are you putting into you? You know, all of that needs to be kind of addressed. And so when all those things are taken into consideration, I find if we kind of address those things that that person will be able to utilize glucose better and thus they start feeling better. I like it. Yeah, we're all on the holistic approach of all the diet and lifestyle factors here. No, Dr. Jamie is. But yeah, why don't you respond, Jamie? Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with that. Uh, people who you know follow me know my kind of five pillars are really nutrition, movement, sleep, stress, and environment. So environment being chemical exposure and, and toxins and phthalates and endocrine disruptors because I I work in women's health, so that's a huge issue for a lot of female patients. Uh, so I couldn't agree more with that. Um, when we think, though, about glucose and ketones as different fuel sources, there's definitely, you know, differences. And I guess I would make the argument that, um, you know, I don't know that we know what the preferred source is. Certainly, uh, most people are glucose burners uh, because they've never actually <laughs> tapped into their fat stores. So a lot of my, you know, overweight, insulin resistant, and obese patients, but you know, you could argue that per molecule, glucose versus ketones, that ketones make more ATP, uh, you know, molecule per molecule with less reactive oxygen species. So, you know, I really view them as a very clean burning energy source, but I have, you know, no problem with, with using glucose as energy. But I think that when we think about our activity levels throughout the day, that most people, you know, would benefit from baseline fat oxidation, like I said, and using glucose as a faster burning energy when, when we need it. And if we you know, think about it ancestrally, like if we have to chase down a buffalo or, or something like that. But if we're just sitting, resting, you know, we really should be doing baseline fat oxidation. Kate? Uh, that I would agree with. Um, that's why I believe, you know, sleeping is the time to actually utilize fat as fuel. And that is, I mean, I, and I think that's where our body is flexible. And that's when we should shift to these different uh, nutrient or macronutrients, depending on what you're doing. Um, I guess in today's world, where I think all of us are inundated with a ton of stress, um, utilizing fat as fuel doesn't seem ideal to me. As far as ketones is concerned, um, I think there's context that has to be given to that as far as if it actually has less oxid oxidative stress, I think in the presence of carbon dioxide, I don't know if that's necessarily true. I think that when glucose is oxidized through the entire cycle and not just through glycolysis, that actually that studies I have seen in the presence of a lot of carbon dioxide that actually glucose in itself actually has a lower level of uh, ROS. What do you think, Jamie? I mean, we, we really need to nail down on this the preferred fuel source or which one is more stressful. That, I mean, and stressful, in quotes, is a lot of different things, and it could be ROS, and it could be other things. I mean, I know the pro-metabolic crowd says that keto, like being in keto or fasting, is a stressful state, and it's bad. But, yeah, so, Jamie, if you could maybe just dive into the – at the cellular level a little more. Well, yeah. So, you know, a lot of people bring up this idea of cortisol and that it's cortisol that's driving gluconeogenesis and so that it's very stressful to be in ketosis and it's not, you know, a normal physiologic state. But, you know, and what I do in taking care of pregnant patients, uh, pregnant women, it's actually very interesting when you look at the physiology because a pregnant woman will actually have readily available glucose and ketones for her baby. So it's nature's way of basically always making sure that there's a fuel supply to the baby. Um, but we know from umbilical cord studies that babies actually make their own ketones too. Um, and so in the early days as humans, we actually use ketones. It's an important part of myelination of the brain. And breast milk's high in MCTs. It's also high in carbs too. Um, and so I think it's interesting to look at, you know, these small babies, like what is the preferred fuel source? I think it's both. But as we age and we become less active, you know, Kate had kind of said, you know, sleeping is a great time for fat oxidation. We're definitely not as active as, as, you know, our ancestors first were. And I totally agree that if somebody is eating a, a carbohydrate rich diet and then attempts the ketogenic diet, we know that in the first couple of weeks, there's this period of, you know, what people will describe as, as keto flu. And this is when we can see increases in cortisol. So in the early days of trying to adopt a low carb or ketogenic diet, we do see increases in cortisol that help, you know, uh, drive gluconeogenesis. 
But with time with keto adaption, we really don't see that. Um, the unfortunate part is we don't have a lot of long-term studies. You know, some have been done for 12 weeks, maybe 20 weeks at most. So that's the really hard part of a lot of nutritional research is that it's never in the context of a ketogenic state. So that's the really difficult part. Um, but I, I don't agree that it's necess necessarily, you know, stressful long-term. On a cellular level, there there is more ATP production per molecule when you when you burn a uh, you know beta hydroxybutyrate. Um, there is more reactive oxygen species when you burn glucose, and ketones as a fuel source, <coughs> excuse me, um, also tend to re upregulate mitochondrial enzymes. Um, there's an increase in glutathione peroxidase, so our own antioxidant systems. Um, ketone bodies tend to be directly anti-inflammatory, so inflammation is like the new hot buzzword for every sort of disease process, but that's through inhibition of the NLRP3 inflammasome. So there's there's all these cellular signaling pathways if we want to talk about, you know, on a cellular level. I think for, for most people listening, it'll be down in the weeds. They don't they really won't understand it. But um, there's they're definitely different fuel sources as as far as the outcome. Kate that yeah they are i guess my understanding of one ketone doesn't it burn how, how many atp does it create that was like 28 or 26 am I, am I wrong or i don't know how many it is yeah i can't remember off the top of my head it's a couple more than glucose <clears throat> okay cuz i my understanding was like 24 cuz somebody was arguing with me about this and i mean cuz glucose one molecule you'll get about 36 to 38 so i guess i was like confused on exactly what the number was. Obviously, through fat oxidation, there will be more ATP. But from my understanding, it's glucose just moves through the process much quicker. And so the, because if we use time as a factor, then um, that glucose will actually produce more ATP. But the studies that I have seen, it is that they, yes, they will show glucose will produce a higher amount of reactive oxygen species. But with the introduction of more carbon dioxide, which the glucose does produce over fat, that seems to be reduced. And so that's my understanding. Again, I could be wrong, but that's my understanding that in the presence of carbon dioxide, which uh, I would love to talk about because I guess I never quite understand what the medical world's view of what carbon dioxide is doing in the body. But in, in the bioenergetic world, it's actually serving as a antioxidant and a basically facilitator to help oxygen get into the tissue to help improve the metabolic processes. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting, it's not some, like, I definitely don't think of carbon dioxide when I'm, you know, thinking about energetics and, 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 um, you know, how to tell a patient to eat. But um, one of the reasons that ketogenic therapies are actually used like we'll just bring up some neurologic conditions like Alzheimer's, for instance, is because people who have broken mitochondria, which is like the 88% of people, you know, that I'm seeing in my clinic, is that when, when they have broken mitochondria, specifically at the level of the brain with something like Alzheimer's, I'll just use it as an example, that ketones are an alternative fuel source and they have a decrease in pyruvate dehydrogenase and they have a decrease in the ability to use GLUT4 transporters. So in people with broken cells, ketones can can circumvent this and, and actually provide cellular energy, which is why people with epilepsy, Alzheimer's tend to get better with, with therapeutic ketosis. For somebody like myself or Kate or Brian, <laughs> that's pretty dang healthy and has really good, you know, um, metabolic health, either one is probably fine. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I agree. I think a, a ketogenic diet for a lot of um, therapeutic measures has been shown great promise. And I think that, that can, can they possibly utilize other ways? Meaning could a pro metabolic diet work for someone that has some of these neurodegenerative issues? I don't know. I haven't ever seen a study on that. I haven't seen a lot of studies, honestly, on this kind of diet in particular, but, um, but I can just t tell you anecdotally through my own practice, it certainly, not, and not, I haven't worked with anyone with epilepsy or a severe neurodegenerative issue, but I have worked with people that have severely been sick and that if we can get them over time utilizing carbohydrates better, and again, there's kind of a method to the madness, um, their health does seem to significantly improve um, 
with some caveats. Yeah. So how, what is that approach? Because it seems, I understand Dr. Jamie's approach. Cause I, you know, I, I started out in the low carb world and it's like, these are the easiest things to cut out. Cause you're going to end up cutting yeah. out most of the refined foods and people do just do a lot better with them, but then, you know, come full circle. And it's like, okay, maybe they, they aren't actually the problem. It's a good intervention to cut out carbs, but it's not like the end all be all. And we're just saying carbs are bad. Right. So then we circle back to whole food carbs. But what is the sort of intervention in the pro world and how like how would you reverse, say, type two diabetes uh, in someone? And you say maybe it's like a slower approach. It seems uh, it seems a little counterintuitive when you're saying let's just give them, you know, fruits and and orange juice or whatever else the pro world entails. Yeah. So. And I don't know if you've ever researched some of the 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 old researches back in like the 1930s and 40s who were were utilizing super high carbohydrate diets to cure everything from kidney disease to um, glaucoma to heart disease. So one of the big guys was Walter Kempner, and he developed the rice diet. Yeah. And you probably maybe have heard of him. And so and he yeah. get, and his diet was basically like white rice, fruit fruit juice and white sugar. That was 95% of the diet. And then it was like a little bit of fat and a little bit of protein, but that was it. It was like 95% carbohydrates. And it, his initials intentions were to help people with kidney disorders and with heart issues. Um, but some of us, and a lot of his patients also had diabetes. So the thought process initially was obviously a diet of 95% carbohydrates to totally whack that person out, right? That would be the common thought. But what ended up happened was 15% of people, I think, got worse, 15% didn't change, and then 70% improved, either totally cured themselves of their diabetes, got off insulin, and got basically healed on a 95% carbohydrate diet. So the question is, what the hell happened? How did that work? How were they able to basically, what you would think would be a sugar disorder, cure it with essentially sugar. And so the belief with that is that diabetics also have usually a high amount of fat in their blood as well. And, and I know you've probably ever talked about the Randall cycle, but it's that fatty acid, glucose, metabolism kind of competition. And so, and I think this is where these two approaches are very interesting because it's usually that the middle ground, the high fat, high carb diet that gets everybody in trouble. Mm -hmm. And so, and again, and I'm not against fat and I'm not, and I'm not saying you should do a 95% carbohydrate diet, but I just think it's an interesting study to pay attention to, to go, wait, maybe sugar is not the problem. Maybe it's not carbohydrates, but, but it is when someone has a lot of fat, an excessive amount of fat, and then consume sugar. And then there's this competition that goes on and either sugar is unable to get into the cell or if it gets in, it isn't able to be metabolized. And so it just basically continues to rise. And so somebody ends up having hyperglycemia, diabetes, whatever. But if you can reduce the fat to nothing and give them all of this carbohydrates, what ends up happening is it actually starts to metabolize. And then, of course, the fat that, they, that does get entered into the blood is their own fat. And most of these people that went on this diet surprisingly lost hundreds of pounds. I mean, it's an extreme level, and, it, and I, again, I wouldn't say do this, and it, it does have its, uh, the negatives, right? So I wouldn't say you need to do this long periods of time. But what they did find is that people that did this diet six years later had still, like I think it was like 48% had still remained to keep all the weight off, and were still good, which is way better than, what, 20% of people that still are on the diet after a year. So I just think it's an interesting way to look and say, huh, why are these things happening? What is going on? Yes, could you remove the carbohydrates to get it? Or could you remove the fat and allow the body to utilize carbs better? And that can be the answer. I love that stuff because yeah, I've been talking about this since my single digit podcast episodes of both sides can work and I understand them. But then there's way more things to discuss like nutrient density. And that yeah, eating a bunch of white rice and orange juice is a very, very nutrient poor diet. But that also, yes, if you're not taking in fat, then there's no real fat to store. And that, that that's always made sense to me once I started like kind of getting into it. It's like, yes, of course I get it. Cause then you, that's how it's like, people are all in a low carb. They're all like, we got to lower insulin and all this stuff. And they have this model. But if you kind of look at it from the other side, it's like, well, if you, 
you don't have any fat that you're ingesting, then yes, you could just burn your own body fat. And so that makes sense. Yeah, there's the McDougal starch diet. There, there's the mastering diabetes guys that uh, I've heard, you know, being interviewed talking about their, yeah, like basically the same thing with just a million fruits and all that. And they're reversing diabetes and I get it. But still, I, I don't think that's the optimum way to do it at all. And I think uh, there's a lot of nutrient and protein deficiencies there. But I guess I'll let Dr. Jamie jump back in. Yeah, I think what most pa patients struggle with is controlling carbs and fat, right? These are our energy calories. I'm a huge proponent of eating at a higher protein threshold because it protects the lean body mass, especially if a patient's trying to lose weight. <laughs> Excuse me. It's it's hard to gain weight eating, a, uh, you know, excessive amounts of protein. But what's what's hard for patients is satiety. And so the higher protein helps with satiety. But I find that patients that choose to eat a lot of carbohydrates and low fat um, have problems with, with blood sugar control. This is in my clinical experience because they're riding a roller coaster of, of a high glucose, low glucose. They have to eat more often um, to help reduce and, and mitigate those effects. And most of the patients I take care of that are eating 400 plus carbs per day. Most of them are bodybuilders <laughs> and uh, they have low body fat. They're eating low dietary fat. And what I typically will see is extremely low sex hormone levels, testosterone and estrogen. So I think for the normal everyday person, um, I think it's hard to control. You you have to pick. I always tell my patients, you got to pick which horse to ride. Like because most patients have trouble finding the middle ground, and I just I really find it's just because it if they're eating whole food carbs, great, but most of them aren't. And if you're talking about added sugars and and extra sugars in the diet, I just find that it just ruins people's uh, satiety. Kate, uh, that. And, and and that's where I would agree, right? So just eating, and that's where I don't agree with that diet. Like I don't agree with just having a high, high, high carbohydrate, no protein, very little fat diet. Because again, exactly what Jamie said is that you're going to have some extreme blood sugar issues. So there is a balance. And certainly in a pro-metabolic bioengineering field, we don't prescribe that. It's more of, okay, what can your body handle carb-wise? And then we fill it in with protein and fat. And we use primarily the saturated fats coconut oil, butter, ghee, tallow, and then we use like some really good, easy to digest protein sources from an animal, right? And this could be the fishes and shrimps and shellfish and organ meats and so forth. So we do a variety so they can get their nutritional basis. And then we just find out what can their body tolerate. And yes, sometimes, right, this, they might have to eat more frequently because they can only tolerate 20 grams of carbohydrates at one time. And so, and then it's like, okay, so then we want to eat more. But what we're trying to do essentially is to teach their body to be able to metabolize more carbohydrates. But it is finding where they're at now. And I certainly have worked with people that are coming off carnivore, coming off keto, and obviously they can't tolerate very many carbs at all because they've been fat adapted for so long. And so that is a slow process to get them to a place where they can start utilizing the carbs again and not feel like they're swinging. Because certainly when you go back to carbs after that kind of diet, you swing all over the place. They just can't handle it. And so it is a slow process to get them to a space where they can, but it can happen. And again, it's not immediate. And that's what probably some people don't like about this approach is it isn't, there's not a clear path really. They're just like, just tell me what to do. I'm like, I don't know what you have to do. We're going to go week by week and we're going to adjust it based on how your body's responding. And then, and then from there, we'll keep going with also taking into account, yes, you have a life, you have stressors, there's going to be things that are happening. We have to learn how to kind of pay attention to those things to know that when your body's under more stress, it might need more fuel or that we just kind of have to take those things into consideration. So it's, not just the diet. And I don't ever like to actually say that this is a diet. I like to say it's a understanding, trying to understand your body better. I think we as the human race in general have gotten away from even how our body feels. We don't understand what's going on with ourselves. We're so external that we don't even, can't even read even basic things about ourselves. So I always try to teach people to get back in touch with what is your body saying to you? What do you think you need and feel? And let's go off of that. That's interesting. Maybe I can ask you one question before we go back to Jamie. Why does someone want to be able to eat more carbs? 
I mean, I, I kind of know the answer and I, I kind of know both sides of this, but I want to just know because you, you said that and a lot of people are like, well, yeah, why do I need that? Carbs are not essential. I can have gluconeogenesis. I can make my own glucose and all that type of thing. And, and also, yeah. I, I'm definitely not saying I'm on both sides. I'm not going to take a side, but it's it's just interesting that why do we need it? Because most carbs seem to be a little bit more nutrient poor rather than nutrient dense. Um, well, they're different nutrients, right? I mean, they're certainly, and I would definitely prescribe to the ones, right? So we're more fruit roots. Like that's our general carbohydrates vibe is, is, is fruits, getting the fruits and the easier to digest carbohydrates, not as fibrous or as much cellulose and so forth in it. Um, but, uh, a, a few things, right? Carbs, a, are they, they're a less expensive than eating total protein. Certainly you don't need carbs. You can, t you Protein is your only essential nutrient or macronutrient that you need. Um, but utilizing that as fuel and going through gluconeogenesis is slightly stressful. And utilizing protein as fuel also creates some byproducts that you might not necessarily want. You know, you produce more ammonia. You produce more maybe these free-flowing amino acids that can show to be more inflammatory to your system. Um, high methionine-based diets have been shown to actually decrease lifespan. And so a lot of how people without are breaking glycine, down protein, though. I'm sorry, without glycine, they've only been shown yes. to decrease lifespan in a bad ratio. Yeah, right. And that, that is correct. So definitely having enough bone broth or glycine rich foods is definitely beneficial. So that is a good caveat. But point being is that you're still breaking down. I mean, carbohydrates are, pro are protein sparing, basically. And the other thought process is, a high carb diet, and we'll go back to the whole carbon dioxide, is carbon dioxide is important. Your, your, your cells produce this in cellular metabolism. The reason it's important is it's basically used to help facilitate oxygen getting into the tissue. So we refer to that as the Bohr effect, but that's very important. That's why it's cellular respiration. Our cells essentially need to exchange gases at the cell level. And your oxygen, you need oxygen for cellular metabolism to improve it and to keep it going. Without oxygen, then you create more lactic acid or lactate. And so that's when problems occur, right? Then that's going into the diabetic state or poor cellular or cancer metabolism. But ultimately, it, the huge caveat in there is we're using a fuel that is going to produce the most amount of carbon dioxide which is going to produce the most amount of cellular respiration, which is going to speed up the body's ability to utilize energy. The more energy you are able to produce, the more energy you are able to facilitate not just external things that you're doing, but all the internal functions that your body is wanting to do. Because what do we see lately in today's world is everybody has gut issues, hormone issues, detoxification issues, brain fog. I mean, people are not healthy. I mean, they are... There are so many different functions of them that aren't working optimally. And my belief is, and the bioengenic belief is, it's because we're not being properly fueled with enough energy. And if we can give it to carbohydrates, we'll produce, again, for my thought process or belief system, it produces more ATP and continues the cycle. When I get people utilizing fuel better or carbohydrates better, digestion improves their cycle improves, they're able to get fertile or have a baby or get pregnant, and and essentially their body just feels better. Oh, like, okay. And Jamie? Oh, you're still on mute. You're still on mute, Jamie. Sorry. When we think about the three macronutrients, you know, that are essential for human life, you know, even the Institute of Medicine says carbs are not essential for human life. Now, I'm not saying that means eat zero. But if you're eating, you know, fruits and roots, I still think that people probably aren't eating more than 150 grams, you know, at most. If we're adding additional sugars and juices and things like that, then, then I have concern about glycemic variability for these people because we know that glucose homeostasis is tightly regulated in the body. You know, at any given time, they're really, you know, in a fasted state really shouldn't be more than four to five grams of glucose in the bloodstream, which for people listening, it's like between a teaspoon and one and a quarter teaspoon. So it's like a really tiny amount. And, you know, anything that is going to increase glycemic response and what we call area under the curve, how long is glucose elevated and for how long, 
makes a difference as far as our risk long-term of, of cardiovascular disease and damage to the glycocalyx. And um, in most people who come to me already broken, adding additional carbs, I don't find is what fixes them. And, you know, if I, if I gave them the option of, of rice and fruits and roots, I don't think that they're going to have good enough satiety to fix their, their baseline problems. But that's just the approach I take. So I think that you know, even 150 grams of carbs by most literature, most studies is going to be considered low carb, you mm -hmm. know? So I guess my question for Kate is like, you know, where do you find that carb threshold for people? Cause I just wouldn't find, I just wouldn't find that useful for, for helping people's broken mitochondria. Yeah. And that's, I mean, and of course I don't take, uh, lab tests on broken mitochondria. You know, basically the, the markers that I utilize to help monitor how they're doing and how they're improving is we monitor temperature. So obviously when they're producing more heat and more energy, their temperature improves. Um, we're monitoring their pulse. Uh, we're monitoring their digestion, their sleep, um, essentially their energy level through the day. How are they feeling? Brain fog, their cycle, of course, you know, and I know you know this, Jamie, I mean, a woman's fifth vital sign is their cycle. If they have a really crappy cycle, painful and so forth, right? That's a sign that something's wrong within your health. And so those are the markers that I use. Um, and certainly, right, for any individual that will come in, it's okay, how are you feeling? And if they feel like their blood sugar is all over the place, then sometimes I actually pull carbohydrates back on some people because it's all based on how well they're responding. And so, it's finding, uh, what I'm looking for is constant energy through the day. How are they feeling? How is their energy? Is their temperature and pulse staying up, right? Because our temperature as a human should be around 98.6 midday. And if we're chronically low, and what's, that's what I see in people with their 96, 96 degree, 97, 96 degrees, um, then th in my opinion, they're not producing enough energy. Somewhere they're in either a hypometabolic, hypothyroid state, their body has basically down-regulated, and it's down-regulated because their the body is essentially saying, we're not, being, we're not able to produce enough energy to keep up with the stressors placed upon us. And your system, that's what thyroid does, it will down-regulate when that kind of stress cycle occurs. And so for us to kind of maximize their energy, we have to make sure they're getting enough fuel so that their body can meet the demands that are being placed upon it. And in today's world, right, even though, you, you, and you might say people are lazy, they're not doing as much, and I would agree with you on many levels, but they're also just inundated with chronic stress everywhere, every day, phones, this, I mean, just stresses everywhere. And whether it's just in your head making you stressed out, but people are just being affected all the day, all day long. And yeah, most people, I'm sure even ones that will come into you, if you ask them about their diet, it's not like they're really eating whole fruits, roots, and, you know, whole foods. They're eating crackers and bread and, you know, the Danish, and they skip their breakfast. And, you know, they don't really have good eating habits in general. Most people don't. And so it's establishing, yes, this isn't just eating these foods, but it's understanding when you eat them, how you eat them, how does your body respond? I mean, I really have to get people invested into their own health and an understanding of what's going on with them and not just say, remove this food, because if you remove it, you will. And I agree. I mean, people do feel better sometimes just removing those foods. And it's easier, right, for their brain to just say, take that out, um, because there's so many other things happening and, and they have to kind of grasp with this sort of approach. But my opinion and my experience is that once I can get them to kind of be uh, a little bit more into their, how their body is feeling and learn to pay attention to different markers, then they actually understand, huh, I know when I'm going to be busier today that I probably am going to maybe have to eat a little bit more, have a little better snack and so forth. And I feel better, my energy. And then I can, how well I ate that day will basically result in how well they sleep that night. Because if they ate well and they supported themselves, they will sleep well. If they don't, usually they might have a crappy night of sleep. So, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a learning process and there is a level of investment that has to go in. And that's why it's not just a here, do this. It's a here, do this. And then next week we might change it. And the next week we might change it. And the next week we might change it until you've got a good understanding of what your body might need at, at different times.
All right. Yeah. A lot of interesting stuff there with the, you want to have a higher metabolism. You want to have a higher temperature. I like that stuff. I've been interviewing a couple of people lately about that. Um, so I don't know. I'll just let Dr. Jamie respond. You, you kind of covered a lot of things. Yeah. I mean, I think by checking the temperature, we're kind of, you know, this idea of like ramping the metabolism. And of course, metabolism is, is a moving target, especially in women. Uh, when we get into luteal phase, we see an increase in core body temperature and increase the metabolism by sometimes upwards of 250 calories, which I would love to have a raging metabolism because I'm a girl that loves food, <laughs> loves to eat food. <laughs> so I would love to eat as much as I can. But I think when we think about longevity, it sounds great, right? To have a super active metabolism, a, a super active thyroid. Shoot, there's patients that try to abuse thyroid medication for that exact reason. But when we look at longevity studies, um, and I, you know, pulled one earlier today that was in JAMA, you know, as we age, uh, you know, even a higher thyroid hormone, a higher metabolism level actually decreases longevity of about three and a half years, you know, so, so I don't know that the, the argument for, you know, eating a more, you know, energetic diet to, to try to mitigate stressors in the environment is necessarily the answer. There's, you know, lots of ways to hormesis and, and cold therapy and, and other things, but, you know, you could also make the argument that, that ketones, because I've said this, you know, multiple times work through cellular signaling that they activate a receptor called the FFAR3 receptor, which is actually a modulation of sympathetic tone and heart rate. So, you know, I think there's, there's lots of pathways, you know, to, to the end result, I guess, is what I'm saying that the human body is pretty cool and it's complex, but I guess I just don't understand, you know, that trying to ramp the metabolism is, is the way to reduce disease. So I guess my question would be in the study is I'm always curious how they mark like metabolism, because again, is it marked by how many calories that person is burning and utilizing? Because I, in, in my opinion, you have a healthy metabolism, which is actually run by thyroid and in a low stress state. And that's when you're burning lots of calories, maybe in that basal metabolic state. And the, those calories are being utilized for function, right? Digestion, having a good period, muscle tone, so forth. Yes, but then there's this other pathway, if we go into all those stress pathways, that can still burn lots of calories, right? We can burn a lot of cap calories in that sympathetic state. However, it comes at a price. And the price is that the other functions in our body don't work well. And so we have decreased digestion, decreased function. And, but we see those people. We see the people that are running in this high stress state and they can utilize tons of calories, yet they're still in that sympathetic state. So I'm always questioned like, well, how are they deciding that a high metabolism, like what are they defining that as, is decreasing somebody's lifespan? And, and I guess I'm just confused on like, well, how are they marking that? Because in my brain, when you have a high metabolism, you have good cell renewal, you have good function, everything's working optimally. You have, the, like they say, the metabolism of, of more of a child where you're you're running warmer, you're able to eat a variety of foods, you sleep well, you feel good. Um, I'm not sure why that would end somebody's age, their, everyone's life shorter. So I'm always just curious how they... This yeah. particular study was looking just at thyroid levels. So after the age of 50, people that had a, a higher T4 and T3 level lived three and a half years on average less than their cohorts that had that had lower levels. But when we look at some of the longevity research, we know that caloric restriction actually increases longevity as long as it's not in the face of malnutrition. So I just, you know, don't agree that that trying to ramp the metabolism, you know, helps long term. Um, Dr. Aaron Eric, Eric Verdon, excuse me, at the Buck Institute has, you know, published a lot of data on longevity and a lot of it comes down to sirtuin genes and the NAD ratios and the ketogenic diet is one way to upregulate those things. So once again, I just, I just don't see the, the benefit. Like I said, I'd love to have a raging metabolism, but when we think about long-term feeling and functioning good for a really long time, like I, my husband knows, I would love to live to be a hundred, <laughs> but I don't think driving the car faster necessarily is the answer. Yeah. I'll just jump in. I, I can kind of see both sides of this a little bit. I mean, but the, the animals with the, the smaller animals with the higher metabolism, metabolism have shorter lives. It's, you know, I don't know if that's a good argument or just, just if you kind of think like, if I have to process more calories over my life, that might not be a good thing. But then I also see the side of you want to be in top metabolic health and being able to have a 
a really high metabolism. So I see that side too, but I, but maybe Kate, you could respond. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it all depends on the context you're taking it. And so, you know, those, I think that like kind of those rate of living theories where you're eating less than, and it's correlated to longevity. I don't know. Right. I think that's where the other studies I think have, have said, Hey, just a low methionine diet also can actually have a long life as well. So is it just you're maybe with these lower calorie diets, are they just eating less crap and that's what's keeping them alive longer? Or are they, is it just, they're eating less? I don't know. I mean, I don't know if we've really done that. So if we actually gave them real good foods and actually supported cellular energy, would that have make a difference? Would, because again, in my experience, when I improve someone's overall metabolism and now they're able to digest food better, they're not having all this bloating, they're actually having a good cycle. Um, they can sleep better. I don't see why any of those things, and, they're, and ultimately, yes, their body temperature and pulse improve, and they are able to eat more with at least out gaining weight. I don't, that to me, nothing makes sense to me that says, well, that's going to end their life quicker. Um, right. So just, I guess just measuring and utilizing TSH and T3, T4, I mean, that is a metric. I'm not sure that would still be the best metric. Certainly if someone is also taking thyroid medication, I've certainly seen this and their body doesn't have the other resources, right? Because we know thyroid just kind of turns things up and down. And if somebody's taking it and they don't have the other resource nutritionally or energetically, that thyroid medication either is producing some sort of stress on their system and it can make them worse, right? We know we just can't take thyroid and it's going to make us metabolic engines and everything's going to do well. It doesn't really work that way, especially if we don't have all the other cofactors that is going to help the cells utilize energy better like energy. So I think there's a lot of variables there. I'm, so I'm not sold on the fact that, yes, we should eat less to live longer. I think if we should eat right and improve health, then we'll live longer. Yeah, well, I'm not in the calorie restriction camp long term. And actually, yeah. seeing of calorie restriction, I think that's where people come into problems. People say that keto or other things are stressful. And or there's different things that they say and why it's bad and they have maybe low thyroid and all these problems. I think that's more to do with caloric restriction, like long-term caloric restriction. And I see people anecdotally who have problems on the more keto carnivore diets and they do, they look emaciated. Like they are too thin. They are not eating enough calories. And I know people personally, and they did start eating more calories and everything came back to normal. So, well, that's, I, I guess I covered a couple of things, but I'll go back to Jamie. Which one do you want me to address? I don't know. <laughs> all of the things. Yeah. Yeah, all of the things. Um, so, uh, oh gosh. Okay. So, I mean, I think the this idea of bioenergetic, I think where it, it could find clinical value is people that come from a place of chronically eating or under eating or chronically dieting. Because I think there is a, a huge camp of particularly women out there that come from that space and they don't know how to eat more and, uh, you know, and they don't feel comfortable with gaining a little bit of weight to help repair some of the things going on inside their body. But uh, from, from my standpoint, reducing chronic disease and living a long, wonderful life, um, I don't think the ability to eat more is the answer. I think it's adequate nutrients and adequate calories and not anything more or less. And then, and Jamie, can you talk? Oh, no, actually, maybe we'll go to uh, Kate on the keto and the stressing the liver. Or the, I think that's what they say is that the cortisol or something it, producing gluconeogenesis is a stressful thing. The way I understand it is the liver is always doing something. Like the liver, it, it's not just that, oh, man, it's got to create glucose. Like it's it's going to burn out or it's so stressful. I mean, what is the liver doing when it's not? They're, they're, it's always doing something. So I don't. I've never really understood the point on the pro-metabolic side saying that ketosis is stressful. Well, I think anytime you remove glucose and carbohydrates in general, you're usually going to initiate stress pathways. So ketones are only created in the lack of glucose. And so if you believe that glucose is your ideal source, then having this alternate path is going to create some sort of stress. Now, can ketones be util utilized as a fuel source? Absolutely. Um, but they can't, right? You can't have zero glucose running through your system. It's, you can never have zero. It, your, your liver needs to function on glucose, right? It can't use ketones. And your brain still has to function on some sort of glucose, even though it can utilize ketones. So you can't go zero. I mean, you can, 
But if you do, your body's still going to go through some process of gluconeogenesis to produce some carbohydrates to regulate you. And when you do that, and again, I haven't seen longer term studies and Jamie's saying that, you know, over time, it's saying that it, there's not a level of glucose. But again, we don't have super long term studies on ketogenic diets that see two, three, four, five, six, ten 10 years. What are they doing to people? Um, is it is it produ- producing some sort of stress on their system? You know, again, coming from that, again, my the, my belief system and how your cells work, carbon dioxide is important. And so it's important to produce as much as you can to help facilitate oxygen getting into the tissue. And when you reduce that either through lipolysis or uh, utilizing ketones, then you're not, not going to get as much carbon dioxide or oxygen into the tissue. So there's going to be kind of a bottleneck there. And if that's important, then why would you ever want to do something that's going to reduce that very important molecule? So here's something I was thinking about. With if, even if there was a little bit of stress making your own glucose, but there's also a big stress of eating all the time, processing all the, the carbohydrates, going on this blood sugar roller coaster, there's always a, a toll when you eat, right? There's always some sort of thing that happens to fuel your body. And it seems, I guess, the more keto crowd or more lower carb crowd is like, we don't want to eat all the time. We want to give our gut a break. Like, when is our gut going to repair? And, you know, there's all these good benefits and uh, with, with intermittent fasting. So maybe I'll throw it back to Jamie on that side. Well, so the reason, Brian, that we see increase in cortisol when people first adopt a low carb or ketogenic diet is really because as you uh, take away the carbs in the diet, we reduce insulin levels and insulin in the distal nephron of the kidney is involved with reabsorption of sodium. So as soon as somebody drops carbs out of their diet, we're going to see sodium loss in the urine, it's due to the sodium loss that we see things like noradrenaline and cortisol start to increase. Um, but as long as you have adequate sodium replacement, which is super important, that's you know one thing that in ketogenic therapy in the first couple of weeks is extremely important to replace additional sodium and potassium, things like that to mitigate those risks. But long term, you know, this uh, the body loves homeostasis. It loves to try to find you know, the perfect middle ground. Um, like I said, I don't think people need to be in ketosis all the time, but I think periods of ketosis, um, you know, weeks at a time in, in people's year, uh, I think is important for metabolic flexibility. I, there are some people that could probably just live on glucose all the time. I think there's genetic susceptibility there and probably the microbiome is what we'll figure out <laughs> in the next 10 years. It's probably really what's at play there. But, um, you know, I agree with you, Brian. Um, I, I leave a, lead a super busy life and I don't have time to eat multiple times per day. Um, I eat two, three meals at most, and it wouldn't be good for survival of our species if we had to eat all the time. Um, and you know, even with 72 hours of fasting, you know, we really don't see a lot of, a a lot of metabolic problems that occur. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think going back to the ancestral kind of thought, you know, I agree that, that certainly our ancestors, it wasn't wise for them to have to be eating every two to three hours. And, and they really didn't have the capabilities to do that. Um, but we don't live in that world anymore. And in that world, it wasn't, I, you know, t- the difference with today in the modern world, the industrialized world is we are under chronic stress. We are inundated with lights and TVs and cell phones and all of these things that are chronically hitting us all day long. It's a different world. And if we look at cultures, you know, that have lived the longest and whether they're just places in the world or, you know, certain areas in the world, I mean, most of those cultures that have lived long lives are eating a predominantly carbohydrate diet. Um, There's other things that are going on in their lives. You know, maybe it's just a healthier space. Maybe they're not inundated with pollution or whatever it is. But if you look from that perspective, um, from I, from what I know, there are no long living cultures that are consuming a predominantly ketogenic diet. And I guess that's when am I, my, when it, where I get stuck, it's like, okay, well, show me people that have lived long lives that are doing this. I'll let Jamie answer, but I just know that yes, in more modern times, there's not a lot of cultures that are, are native living with 
you know, n not the modern foods come in that have access to a lot of meat and fat like our ancestors were ancestors would have done and we can't go back and see exactly how long our ancestors lived but i know for the majority of human history we were having access to these high fat and meat diets and yes i i do know you know that the katavans and tokelauans and there's all these different populations that do eat high starch diets kind of by force you know this is what they have access to they or even the the okinawans and it's like well they had all these sweet potatoes and they had fish and they had some pork and it's you know like they're, they're it's kind of not their choice and yes they are eating whole foods diets and maybe we could probably agree on is the low PUFA content. Like these people did not have seed oils. They did not have that. And that's, I thought was the leading theory of why they live long lives is the lack of PUFA, not because of they ate a bunch of starches. So I'll, I'll hand it to Jamie. Yeah. I mean, I completely agree. You know, they <laughs> devoid of chemicals. They're in the sunlight constantly. So circadian rhythm hormones were, you know, a huge issue. So, you know, I agree with Kate that there's all these other things that we have to mitigate, blue light exposure, poor sleep, you know, stressful jobs and, and uh, EMF. And I mean, we could go down all sorts of rabbit holes, but I don't really see how increasing carbohydrates mitigates those modern day stressors that most people have to deal with. Well, I would say the only way that is, is because under chronic when a body's under stress, and when I re reference stress, and I know because Brian's kind of like, hey, when your body has to digest things, isn't that stress, isn't that? And it, essentially, yeah, and how I view stress is it is a stress is anything or it's it's more than your body can handle. And so it's more, it's an, an excess of, of, of needs that are put upon the body that your body can't reduce enough energy for. And that results in a stress. And the stress, in my opinion, will revolt in a stress pathway, right? Because if your body can't produce enough energy for whatever needs or you're putting upon yourself, then it's going to go into stress pathway. So it's going to break down tissue or muscle or whatever to help give yourself the energy it needs to keep up with whatever stress you're putting upon it. And so to me, that's a stress. So, and so as long as, again, if you are having digestion and you are giving your body enough fuel and energy, then I wouldn't necessarily see digestion as a stress. I would just see it as a metabolic thing. As long as you're well-fueled, it isn't put upon you as a stress. And so maybe you're seeing it, hey, the more times I have to digest is the more energy my body will need to actually do the digestion. <laughs> and I would say yes, and that's why I would say that's why it would be important to make sure that you are eating enough. And again, I don't, I don't necessarily mean everybody needs to eat five or six meals a day. I think you can be totally fine on three meals a day. And I think if you are actually very healthy and you're well fueled, you can do two meals a day. So I don't think it's necessarily you have to be eating every two or three hours. I just find that people that are having glucose issues and are not able to metabolize sugars well, that they actually do better at initially eating small frequent meals throughout the day. Yes, that would be maybe one of the, the things that people don't like. And that would be maybe more advantageous to do something that you are keto based because you aren't eating as often, but to heal somebody, that's usually the route you have to go. It's small, consistent meals initially. Mm -hmm. And then as they get healthier, maybe they can do less meals and do bigger meals. But, you know, I also, in my world, I'm dealing with a lot of people with GI issues. And so they might only be able to handle small amounts of food. They can't handle these big meals. It's just too much for them. Mm. Well, maybe they have GI issues because, yeah, the types of food they're eating. And also, I, yeah, I meant stress as in like a toll, not exactly stress, stress and a toll on your body are different things. And speaking of GI issues, a lot of people resolve GI issues by not eating so often, by giving the gut a break. And, you know, I, I, yeah, I mean it as a toll. And also eating, eating small frequent meals sounds like a, a recipe for gaining weight. And I think I've talked to some people who've gone, they've gone hardcore carnivore and then they've gone pro metabolic and it's allowed them to eat more and they kind of gained a lot of weight. I mean, it could be a good thing, but maybe they've gained too much because if you know, eating a lot of small meals and a lot of extra carbs, or even if they're whole foods, just is a recipe to eat more. But maybe you're saying that's a good thing. I don't know. I'll hand it to Jamie. Yeah. I mean, I don't think eating a low carb diet, you know, that's adequate in, in nutrients is inherently stressful. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily understand, you know, that argument, I guess. Well, it let, we, we only have a couple minutes. I want to talk about red meat because I noticed Kate did not include that in her animal foods. She had dairy and seafood and mollusks and a bunch of, you know, nutrient dense things, but why not red meat? Uh, well, you actually probably didn't see the most recent post I did probably a week ago, and I did uh, real food superfoods, and I actually added red meat in there. 
And so I'm not against red meat by any stretch. I usually put more emphasis on the other ones solely. And the reason being is that a lot of meat, the, 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 the caveats are is one of the things that we focus on in the pro-energetic world is this calcium to phosphorus ratio and trying to consume more calcium rich foods over more phosphorus rich foods. Because one thing we know is we take kind of a, into look at the parathyroid hormone and in a stress state, and as you get older, if you have elevated, elevated parathyroid hormone, then you're going to have more bone breakdown. And we see that in high phosphorus diets or low calcium, low vitamin D diets. And so the emphasis is to try and give more calcium to phosphorus. And obviously meat has no calcium. And so that's where that emphasis. It doesn't mean you can't have it. Certainly recommend it. Some people we, I would recommend it more to, depending on if they can manage uh, milk and dairy at all. But um, it's just not put as a, a, a one that you should eat tons of. Mm. It's a use moderately. But I do think it's a very good nutrient, especially the ones that actually have more collagen in, in them, you know, like the, the strip steak or um, skirt steak, excuse me, or um, flank steak, ones that uh, have a little bit more of the gelatinous based uh, uh, collagen in there. Yeah. Okay. And, and Dr. Jamie? Well, a lot of the studies that really try to vilify, you know, red meat, these observational studies, they, you know, we can't really prove the, you know, causation and the confounding variables. And so a lot of the nutrition research on red meat is just totally skewed from a political standpoint. Um, meat and animal fat, in my eyes, are absolutely essential for, you know, our bodies, our sex hormones are, are made from fats. Uh, fats have just been vilified across the board, you know, ever since the 1940s and 1950s. Um, you know, specifically saturated fats, and that's why red meat gets lumped in there. But most people don't know that a, a ribeye steak actually has just as much monounsaturated fat, almost close to as the amount of, of saturated fat. And, you know, a lot of people would want to take this the political route of, you know, uh, the meat industry and farming techniques and its impact on the ecosystem. And so, unfortunately, you know, red meat has really just been drugged through the political arena and, you know, if this this plant based diet movement, uh, I'll be real honest, it's going to destroy more life on this earth than than if we could figure out how to do sustainable cattle farming and regenerative farming. Um, I think red meat and animal fats have an absolute place in our diets. We've been eating them for more than, you know, two million years. And if you remove industrial seed oils and flours and, and refined sugars from the diet, um, I find most patients are very metabolically healthy eating red meat. It's super nutrient dense, you know, B12, vitamin D, iron, zinc, we could go on and on, but I think it's a super healthy part of the diet. I love it. I'm on team meat. We have so little time. I just want to cover the cruciferous vegetables. No, neither of you are talking about, oh man, we need to eat a million vegetables. Kate, what do you say? Uh, I would say that I think you can get all your nutrients from animal-based foods plus fruit and roots. And I think the cruciferous or anything goitrogenic um, is when, again, I look at it at a digestibility level, are super hard for your body to process. I think they have low energy um, in them. And so certainly for me, I want foods that are easy to digest and I want them to provide the system with energy. And the, the cruciferous and leafy greens and all of these high nutrient-based foods also have tons of anti-nutrients in them that, again, are super hard for the body to break down and also can inhibit some other nutrient absorption. So I'm not saying you cannot have them. And, and in fact, for most things I say, Hey, if you like these things, cool, have them. Um, I say, if you want them, usually cooking them down to kind of decrease the anti-nutrients is the way to go and just make sure that your body can handle them. And I just have some people that, mm -hmm. you know, have been living off. And I was one of those people that was living off salads all the time. And I had tons of GI issues. I was like bloated constantly. And so until I finally gave them up or at least cooked them, um, you know, I was having some issues, but I just don't anymore. And honestly, fruits to me taste a heck of a lot better than a piece of kale. And mm -hmm. I think most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, don't really love those foods. <laughs> at least that's my opinion. <laughs> That's great. So, Dr. Jamie, real quick. Yeah, well, I, I hated them growing up, but I eat broccoli and Brussels sprouts on occasion, but they're definitely cooked. I have no problem with, like, fermented veggies, but most of the vegetables in my diet are, are roots. I think they taste better. Um, but I don't eat I don't eat cruciferous vegetables all that often. <laughs> I, I love 
love it. I love it. Yeah, so we're against the PUFAs. We we have no time for all these cruciferous vegetables, and we're against, like, processed grains or just grains in general, multiple reasons, and even just the the fortified grains, and it, we fortify them with iron. There's all kinds of stuff going on um, with grains. So, so yeah, we, we did have a lot to agree on, and maybe we didn't cover it till that the very end there, but it was interesting to get into the weeds on some of this stuff. Maybe we'll have to go... Uh, back again at this if uh, people like this when we have more time but um, any closing words before we go no I just want to say thank you Brian and Kate I don't think that uh, in 2021 that we're able to have you know just really collegial discussions like this social media is such a nasty arena and so I just want to thank both of you for uh, you know what both of you do because I think Mm -hmm. to be honest we all add value to people's lives even if we have different approaches I love it. And yeah. Kate? Yeah. And I would agree 100% with Jamie. It is hard to have discussions about anything that people don't agree with 100%, at least in today's world. Um, I have to say, and I have a high deal of respect for Jamie. I mean, there's not a lot of medical doctors that I find that have a deep interest in nutrition. And I know she made a post the other day about, hey, this is the future of, of our health, is to have actually medical doctors have a genuine interest in nutrition and your movement. And I think that would really make a difference because you do not see that. And you have to question why don't we see that since that is the most trusted person that most people say are that within their health. So I can appreciate where she's coming from. And, you know, and I, I appreciate that we could have this conversation um, very civilly. <laughs> I love it. I love it. We'll let Dr. Jamie get out of here and Kate as well. Thank you so much. Hopefully we'll talk again. Sounds good. Bye guys. Okay. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for sharing with a friend, giving a review on iTunes or the podcast app, going to nosetail.org to get your meat and the other stuff we offer. Remember to start back at episode one of this podcast. Eat densely, move intensely. Haven't said that one in a while. And catch us next week for some more.